survey was taken a few years ago that asked 300 professionals one question. What's the worst thing that can happen in sports? Some people said that it was losing at game seven. Others said it was getting swept in four. Some people said that it was missing the World Cup. And some Brazilians said that it was losing to Argentina. Not just the World Cup. Any time. Ever. In any contest. Okay. To snap your fingers, clap your hands, simply to stand up. I would give anything to be able to do that right now. And I would go to extreme measures just to snap my fingers. How crazy is that, huh? And that is why I stand on the firmest affirmation of the resolution resolved. Packing the Supreme Court would do more harm than good. Only two. There are only two mature northern white rhinos left on the planet. And they are both female. And judge, that is why I stand on the firmest negation of the resolution resolved. The USFG should cancel all student loan debt. If you fall in love with me, don't. This isn't some cliche poem about my childhood suffering from the lack of a male role model, because that would be a terrible lie. And my dad raised a daughter with a guilty conscience. Not a liar. You know, I knew I hit rock bottom when the only person that seemed to care was a fast food worker. I rolled up about a quarter to midnight and he asked me how I was. I hadn't been asked that in what felt like an eternity. So I answered honestly and I said, you know, it's been a rough night. And he said, in that case, you came to the right place. And in that moment, as dumb as it sounds, I felt cared about. Swearing on the Bible. Do you understand that shit? Why not put your left hand on the Bible and let your right hand hang down by its side? It's more natural. Or put it in your pocket. Remember what your mother used to say? Don't put your hands in your pocket. Does she know something that we don't know? Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Vince Lombardi, and we're going to be looking at this quotation by examining three strong individuals. So the quotation I selected for us today is by Sir Winston Churchill, who said, perhaps it is better to be irresponsible and right than to be responsible and wrong. In order to win today's debate, the affirmative must simply prove that the minimum wage being raised to $15 an hour does more harm than good. Imagine coming out as bisexual and your life turns into a math class. So, you like boys and girls, right? But how much? 40, 60, 70, 30, 50, 50. I have given zero thoughts on this. And I felt rage for every slap, every kick, every scream, every ounce of pain and terror. I felt standing in front of that closet door lying with blood in my teeth. I took my rage and swallowed it down, and I turned and walked out the door for the last time. I want to thank the judge for being here today, my opponents, and of course, my partner in this debate we're going to have today. The quotation is, if you are sure you understand everything that is going on around you, you are hopelessly confused by Walter Mondale. And I agree with this quotation. Welcome to our 2021 Grossmont College Showcase of Speeches and Debates. We represent the Spring Intercollegiate Forensics Team. Now I know what you're thinking, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be watching a presentation on speeches and debates, and yet you just said forensics team. We did. I know. Most people associate with forensics with forensics pathology, crime labs, dead bodies. But speech and debate teams were known as forensics teams across the nation as long ago as 1925. In this video, you'll learn a brief history of forensics, some background of Grossmont's team, and some recent team experiences. At the end, 
you'll get to view some actual speeches and a debate by members of the Spring Team. Forensics actually started as the study of courtroom speaking and public deliberation around 450 BC in Greece. Forensics began with the sophists, teachers who taught wealthy citizens how to speak in courts of law or other public forums. The forensic science of today uses their evidence to be presented in the court of law so forensics teams continue to be about the art of persuasive speaking. In the 1920s, the first multi-school invitational for speech and debate tournaments were held. Community colleges have had a long history with forensics. Our national tournament, Biro Pi, for two-year colleges, held its first tournament in 1928. Rosemont College has also had a long history of forensics competition. Since Rosemont opened in early 1960s, we have always had a team. In 1996, Rosemont's team took first place in the nation at the Fire Pi National Tournament. In 2007, the team began international travel. Almost every year, the team has been able to compete nationally, most recently in Washington, D.C., Daytona Beach, Florida, and Reno, Nevada in the past few years. Until last year, when all tournaments were canceled due to COVID-19 and we weren't able to continue traveling. This year, however, we have been able to continue competing via Zoom. We've competed both nationally and internationally. And at the Firo Pi National Tournament, we took home a gold team award in debate. Community colleges have had a long history with forensics. Our national tournament, Firo Pi, for two-year colleges, held its first tournament in 1928. You might be surprised to know that at most tournaments, we compete with 30 to 40 colleges, both two-year and four-year universities. So we have had the privileges and challenges of competing against the Air Force Academy, Berkeley, Hofstra University, University of Illinois, UCSD, UCLA, Vanderbilt, and Yale University. Forensics is not just a team. It's a class that serves as a laboratory experience for many of the communication classes offered today at Grossmont. Argumentation in the form of debates, public speaking in the form of informative, persuasive, and impromptu speaking, and oral interpretation in the form of prose, poetry, and drama. Several years ago, a speech was given by a coach at the national tournament, reminding us that forensics celebrates one of America's principles, that of our freedom to speak, he said. Sometimes people complain about debate, but if the alternative is no debate, then I say, bring me a debater. There are those who complain of four letter words and in oral interpretation, but I say, if the alternative is censorship, bring me an interpreter. In this video, you may hear some words, ideas, and issues that you may not agree with. You may be uncomfortable. But we hope you will appreciate this as it should be a place, a college campus, where we can express different ideas and share differing perspectives and listen to contrary beliefs. Because we believe we should celebrate one of America's First Amendment rights, the freedom of speech. Now you are going to listen to some individual speeches and finally a debate by our spring team members. We hope you enjoy them and are encouraged to sign up for our Grossmont Fall 2021 team and become a part of its long history. Life is a hell of a thing to happen to someone. Never have I felt that sentiment more than when I so profoundly experienced a paradigm shift, an overwhelming realization, an instant that seemed to last a lifetime. You see, the other day I went to the doctor's office for my biweekly injection. Just the indignity of having been born in a body that doesn't produce the correct hormones. As I was walking out of the doctor's office, I ran quite literally into a young woman. I looked up to apologize and stared in shock at a face I could never forget. My baby sister, Becca. But when she looked up at me, she asked, 
Who are you? In a study published in 2018 by the American Academy of Pediatrics, it was found that 29.9% of transgender females, over 41% of non-binary youth, and over 50% of transgender males had attempted suicide at one point in their life. Many of these gender diverse individuals experienced family rejection, harassment, bullying, or just felt unsafe to be open about their gender identity. These numbers are especially concerning now. During a time of increasing violence and hateful rhetoric, which President Biden has stated is an epidemic that requires national leadership. This selection shares one transgender and suicide survivor's experience living within a family transformed and torn apart by this epidemic of hate. When My Watch Has Ended by Ren Lee Son. When she looked up at me and asked, who are you? My heart broke and my breath caught. And I remembered the very first time I saw her. She was so small in my hands. I was 12 years old and terrified of dropping this weak old baby. I remember the gold crowned head, the blue eyes. Oh, how she stared at me. And I knew in that moment what it felt to know so certainly that I would sacrifice every ounce of my soul to protect this perfect little girl, my baby sister. <laughs> I remember the infectiousness of her laugh. She would lick the palm of her hands and press them to the dried cereal on her high chair. She would hold her hands over the side and squeal with joy as the dog licked them from her fingertips. I remember holding her in my arms, singing her to sleep as our parents fought. And I pretended as we danced around the room that fear and sadness had no place in our kingdom. When our parents split, she went with her mom and I stayed with our dad. I was happy enough that her mom found a new husband and new stepkids to love, but I was happier still that my baby sister was required to come home to me every month until my home began to change and anger and fear began again. I watched the lines of stress carved shadows into my face and the thought of seeing her walk through the door began to terrify me because from the first moment I held her, I knew nothing in my life mattered more than protecting her. But I didn't know how powerless I was until the moment I realized that the monsters that live under the bed in reality live down the hall. So I learned how to act, how to lie, how to manipulate a situation until I became the sole focus of our father's every failure, anything to make him forget anyone other than me. I learned how to hide my sister in a closet every night so she would never know, never feel, never taste evil. And then... One day I escaped and the evil monster was defeated and my sister and I danced around the room and proclaimed no fear or sadness in our kingdom. And her mom and her shiny new family welcomed me into their home and their arms and I felt relief. No longer would I be unable to breathe knowing how poor a sentinel I was to her. Having spent years 
quieting her laughter and shushing her smiles because we had to stay so, so quiet. But never again we rejoiced and I became the perfect daughter. Until thinking freedom meant I could be free. Thinking my watch had ended, I confessed I wasn't a daughter at all. And I watched as one by one by one as each welcoming smile froze. Because perfect daughters are not allowed to be sons. Not in that house, not in that church, and especially not if they were gay. So I, I tried harder. I shielded my sister from my anger and frustration and despair, and I, I stayed perfect. until I broke. I woke up one day and realized that I had lived my whole life for someone else. Someone who was now grown up, taught that who I am and who I love and how I long to live my life was evil. And when I stood up and said, I can't live a lie any longer, I listened as she called me a monster. And I felt rage for every slap, every kick, Every scream, every ounce of pain and terror I had felt standing in front of that closet door, lying with blood in my teeth in the face of a real monster, years of my life stripped from me so she could stand happy and fed and untouched and disown me. I swallowed my rage down and I walked out the door for the last time. So when I saw the young woman my sister had grown to become, for the first time in three years, Becca! And she looked up at me and she asked, Who are you? I remembered. And then I turned and I walked away. Because I, I realized in that moment of a lifetime of memories flashing in front of my eyes that even if the outcome was the same every single time, I would always stand in front of that door. Because love and sacrifice are gifts you give without expectation, unconditional, even if the person you give those gifts to ends up breaking your heart. Life is a hell of a thing to happen to someone. My watch has ended, and sacrifice is no longer needed. And though the love I felt the first time I saw her will never end, it's time to love myself now and live my life free. This weekend at Qualcomm Stadium, come see Gravedigger take on Monster Mutt. For 20 bucks a seat, you can see them take each other on, but I guarantee you're only going to need the edge. This is the type of enthusiasm we see with Monster Jam. Now, Monster Jam being a collection of monster trucks that come together, smash on little cars, do tricks and flips, and this is because of their dedicated fans. Monster Jam is only a success because of their dedicated fans who buy the merchandise, sit in the seats, and cheer when they see a car set on fire. But this is the problem with Monster Jam. 
And this is what brought me to the question that I've chosen for us today. How will not letting foreign spectators impact the Summer Olympics in Tokyo? And I think it will impact them greatly. And we're going to be taking a look at three points of analysis on how they will be impacted. First, we're going to take a look at their finances and money. Second, we're going to take a look at the spectators themselves. And then finally, we're going to take a look at the essence and the feelings of the games. So let's hop in our monster truck and head on over to my first point, the finances and money of the Olympic Games. Now, to host an Olympic Games is not cheap by any means necessary. And it costs a lot of money from the, the place hosting it and the committees running the Olympic Games. Lost money will be had if we don't have foreigners come to the Games. Lost money and ticket sales and tourism sales will put the Olympic Committee and the red by the billions. This is according to fortune.com. That if we don't have people coming to these games to see them and spectate them, how can we expect to recoup the money we invested to hosting the games to begin with? If Japan, the hoster of the games, can't recoup some of the money that they invested in the games, how can they expect to survive? And the expected money loss for this Olympic Games, if foreigners don't attend, is a lot of money. $22 billion will be lost in revenue. This is predicted by People.com. That if these foreign spectators don't come, they will be losing out on billions and billions of dollars that they invested to host the game, set it up, make sure everything's running correctly, and the committee's time and effort to make sure the games are a success. If they don't do that, they're going to be in the hole. And the thing is, if they don't come, who's going to be there? And this leads me to my next point. If we don't allow foreign spectators to be at the games, who will be at the games? Only 18% of all ticket sales are held by domestic ticket holders, according to The Guardian. This is showing that 20% of the stadium is was planning to be Japanese people. But if that's all there is, well, I feel like a little bit of the stadium and feelings of the games will be lost. Without having full stadiums, people that have trained their entire lives will have a missed opportunity. But According to the LA Times, they predict that the Tokyo Olympics could be another super spreader event. And this puts fear into the people of Japan. See, COVID is a pandemic going around the world affecting everyone. No one wants to be involved with that. And so in essence, to protect the people of Tokyo, they are trying to cut out foreign spectators. According to the WashingtonPost.com, the goal of the Olympics is to make it safe for the people of Japan, especially the people of Tokyo. We see this being the issue that if we allow foreign spectators to come and watch the games, COVID might be a rampant problem in Japan. And so Japan wants to counteract that by not letting foreign spectators come. This would leave very empty stadiums and even maybe more so empty hearts. And this leads me to my last point. This is the essence and feelings of the game. See, the Olympics is a unique event to the world. This is the time where countries put aside their differences, put aside their quabbles, woes, and disagreements, and compete together in an event to see who has the best athletes. And if those athletes don't feel like they're getting the best, well, then they might not feel the same essence of the games to begin with. See, the games is unifying in that sort of sense. The games will be unlike any other in recent history, according to ESPN.com. This is sad. If we don't have the same feelings of the games that we've had in the past of unity, how can we really expect foreigners to only be left out if it's just one group of people. The Beijing Olympics in 2008, with its fireworks shows, digital effects,
dancing, capturing displays is truly amazing. BleachReport.com. This is showing past Olympics and their attempt to unite everyone around a great opening. And unfortunately for the Tokyo Olympics, it might be different. According to the Olympic Committee president, they will be focusing only on the essentials. That means making only efforts for the competition themselves. So we might lose the essence of the Olympics if we don't see foreign spectators coming to see the Olympics themselves. So today, let's crystallize what we've talked about. We've talked about the money and financial impacts of not letting spectators come. We've talked about who would actually go to the games if there was no spectators. And if there was no foreign spectators, how would that affect the essence of the games? So when we ask the question, how will not letting, allowing foreign spectators impact the summer games, we said it would impact them greatly. And just like how Monster Jam relies on its spectators, so does the Olympics. Good start. Good snow contact. Calm upper body. Legs together. No line deviation. Set up for the D-spin and... A survey was conducted a few years ago that asked 300 professionals one question. What's the worst thing that can happen in sports? Some people said that it was losing at game seven. Other people said it was getting swept in four. Some people said it was missing the World Cup. And some Brazilians said that it was losing to Argentina. Uh, <laughs> not just the World Cup, anytime, ever, <gasps> in any contest. But one person answered that the worst thing that can happen in sports is fourth place at the Olympics. Molly's game is the true story of Molly Bloom, a woman who trained for years to be an Olympic skier, was charged and convicted of running high stakes poker games, and went on to write a well-received novel that was turned into an Academy Award nominated screenplay. As we approach the 2022 Winter Olympics, her story lends insight into one Olympic hopeful's mind and shows us what dedication and perseverance looks like. Molly's Game, screenplay by Aaron Sorkin. My father is a therapist and a psychology professor at Colorado State. The second rule of his house was that academic excellence and athletic excellence weren't optional. The first rule was that he made the rules. I have two younger brothers who are also overachievers. While I was third in North America in skiing, my brother Jeremy was number one in the world. And when I was placing into AP Chemistry as a junior, my brother Jordan was doing it when he was Twelve years old? Something like that, I don't know. I was a hotshot student and a hotshot skier everywhere but my own home. This is a true story, but except for my own, I've changed names and I've done my best to obscure identities for reasons that will soon become clear. I'm Molly Bloom, and right now I'm third in North America in women's moguls. I have a BA in political science from the University of Colorado, where I graduated summa cum laude with a 3.9 GPA. The median LSAT score at Harvard Law is a 169. I have a 173. I was raised in Loveland, Colorado. It's an hour outside of Denver or four hours if it's snowing. On a weekend family ski trip when I was five, I was spotted by a coach. 
Attack it, Molly. Attack it. I would spend the next 18 years chasing winter and being coached by the best in the world. I also ran pretty well. I was running a charity 5K when my back exploded. I had what's called rapid onset scoliosis. My spine was curved at a 63 degree angle and I needed a seven hour surgical procedure that involved straightening my spine, taking bone from my hip, fusing 11 vertebrae together and fastening steel rods to those fused segments. She's gonna be fine, but I don't recommend skiing anymore. Definitely not moguls. And skiing competitively is out of the question. I was on skis again within a year. <laughs> Running moguls in 18 months. And by my 20th birthday, I made the US ski team. This is the last round of qualifiers for the Salt Lake City Olympics. It's the champion run at Deer Valley. The altitude is 8,100 feet. The pitch is 52 degrees. It's the same as the sides of the Great Pyramids. The wind is 20 to 25 miles an hour, blowing left to right. It's three below zero at the top of the slope. And with 17 skiers in front of me, it's gonna be like trying to stick a landing on a frozen infinity pool. I can make the US ski team right now. And if I have three perfect runs at Salt Lake, the best runs of my life, I can beat the Austrians and the Swiss and have a realistic shot at the podium. Then a law school of my choice and a startup. A foundation that seeds entrepreneurial women and teaches young girls to ignore most of their current role models. But first, this. Good start. My father's down at the bottom, telepathically trying to get me to check my line. Check your line. I check my line. Good snow contact. Calm upper body. Legs together. No line deviation. Set it for the decent and stick the landing. Now. Two things you need to know before this next trick, which will be a 720. First, is that when visibility is bad as it is now, race officials will jam pine boughs at the edges of a jump so that skiers have some foreground depth reference. The second is that the tightness of our bindings are determined by what's called a din setting. If you're a beginner, your din setting is probably a two or a three. If you're an experienced weekend skier, it's probably a seven or an eight. Mine's 15. My boots are basically welded to my skis. Right. So how does this happen? It happened because I hit a pine bough. And I hit it so precisely that it snapped the release on my bindings. Right in that moment, I didn't have time to calculate the odds of that happening because I was about to land pretty hard on my digitally remastered spine being held together by spare parts from an erector set.
None of this has anything to do with poker. The only reason why I bring it up is because to the person that said that the worst thing that can happen in sports is fourth place at the Olympics? Seriously? <laughs> Fuck you! Welcome to our parliamentary debate. We are going to begin with uh, our Prime Minister, Becca. Don't give up. There's no shame in falling down. The true shame is to not stand up again. That is a direct quote and an important life lesson from the popular anime, Kuroku's Baseball. Today's resolution is anime is better than reality TV. It's gonna be a fun one today. Going into definitions, I would like to define anime as a style of animation orienting in Japan and is characterized by stark colorful graphics depicting vibrant characters and action-filled plots. Better than will be defined as more excellent or effective type or quality. And reality TV is a television program which real people are continuously filmed designed to entertain rather than inform. This is a value debate and our voting, uh, voting criteria is utilitarian, utilitarianism. So we ask that you weigh this debate off of what is best for the majority of the population. Before getting into my contentions, I'd like to say thank you for this wonderful judge and my opposing team and anyone watching this debate. I hope you enjoy it. So getting into our first contention, it is that it's the Japanese economy. Yang Sheng 18 explains that anime makes up 9% of the Japanese GDP. As after the comic strips sterilized and in the famous Comics Weekly become popular works, cartoonists will gr gradually enter various media forms such as television, animation, DVDization, movie theaters, further development, and they become huge brands and they go into things like dolls and games and a lot more. This allows Japanese economy to sustain other industries because the workers who are employed go out and spend their money, which is spent on other sectors of the economy, which in turn hire more people continuing this cycle. Anime also sustains Japanese export industry with Peters 18, finding it accounts for 77% of Japanese exports. Duncan 17, further away from watching anime has become an important tradition in the Japanese population. Such as traditions have led to a greater vacation time, which has made the economy more competitive, such as workers are more productive because they have better mental health. These allow for a strong economy and economists from Oxford University to find that the countries with stronger economies are correlated with lower rates of poverty. Without anime, a loss of 9% of the GDP in one quarter would be the worst recession in human history. Just for a little reference, the Great Depression shrank by 2.7%. And with anime, it would be a whopping 9%. That's a huge gap and it would be detrimental to the economy in general. Our second contention would be cultural decay. Reality TV is bad for society, point blank. That is a fact. As Thomas 07 explains, the norms of reality TV are inconsistent, showing teen rebellion as good and standing up for violence as bad. Similarly, fighting for anything is not acceptable out in American TV outside of very specific genres. You're just supposed to take what is given to you and, dish, and dished out to you and not only whine about it, but the only thing American TV tells you to do is tell somebody else. It completely glances over standing up for yourself and the importance of your own voice and it lacks to teach the youth that they have a voice and they have the power to make change. In addition, Eon 17 adds that the way to view this decay is that TV networks that show reality TV report lower property values than those who do not. Property values are important as they act as a symbol for how much value society puts on a good. The Hornet News reviews numerous studies which all agree that their conclusion, reality television is addictive and influences people 
to engage in bad behaviors. According to Brad Gorham, the Secruz University, reality te television is an effect of behaviors of people in society. As people are easily influenced by reality television, eventually copy the behaviors portrayed in television while using them in real life. Philip Ross, the International Science Times, also states that reality television has a detrimental impact of our perceptions of the world based on observational studies constructed by the University of Wisconsin. During the study of, one of 145, stu 145 students in the University of Wisconsin are surveyed based on their consumption of reality television, based on the results in the study concluded in the majority of students who watched reality television, believe that the argumentative behaviors shown on this TV are sh more addictive than normal behaviors in today in today's society. It is su super important to take this into account that these shows are getting shown to everyone, not just adults, not just to fully developed minds, but to even to children. And I remember when I was a kid, I was forbid by my parents for watching toddlers in tiaras because they said that it made me act more bratty like these children that were in pra pageants. Reality TV has been shown in scientific studies that it is bad for mental health and it's bad for the world around us because it is showing people the dirtiest and grimiest sides of the world and it's saying that that's okay and that's acceptable. It brings out the worst in people and is that really what you want to be showing, being shown around? While anime opens creativity and it makes a door for animation and all of these creators to have their day in the sun and have their art shown and is an important part of Japanese culture. And for these reasons, that is why I firmly, I, I firmly affirm a ballot for the <laughs> affirmative side today. <laughs> Thank you, Becca Roundtree. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, I have just one major question. Yeah, so sure. You're talking a lot about how anime employs people. Do you think yeah. general employment is going to be good? Yes, general employment is good. Okay, so if there was no reality TV, wouldn't all these people that work on those shows be unemployed? No, because reality TV lowers property values, so it's actually bad for the economy. Because if there's no reality TV the property values would be higher, which means more people would be employed. Okay, but my question still stands. Is yeah, I answered the question. Is, so yeah, but is unemployment bad for the economy? Yes, unemployment is bad for the economy. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll now move on to our leader of the opposition, Eli Gale. Almost all Japanese animation is produced with hardly any basis taken from observing people, you know? It's produced by humans who can't stand looking at other humans. In the words of Hayao Mizaki, one of the most popular and influential Japanese artists and film directors in anime history, January 27th, 2014. First, I'd like to thank my opponents for setting up a wonderful case for our debate today. I'd like to thank my partner for helping me to build what I think is the strongest case for the negation today. And I'd like to thank our wonderful judge for helping this debate to happen. And with that in mind, we stand on the firmest negation of the resolution resolved. Anime is better than reality TV. We will let the terms as defined by the app stand, and we will also accept their resolutional analysis with this being a value debate under the criteria of utilitarianism. And with that in mind, we have three contentions for you today, Judge, that will solidify why anime is not better than reality TV. Without further ado, they are contention one, anime stereotypes, condition two, industry working conditions, and condition three, all TV is the same. On to my first contention, anime stereotypes. Subpoint A, my claim is that there are many stereotypes in anime that cause it to not be the art form that it should be. The warrant is that this is shown in many animes. For example, evidence from Vulcan 2019 reports that these stereotypes include excessive politeness, mini skirts all year round, customized school uniforms, and then it also starts to go into some very severe cultural stereotypes that are not acceptable as progressive views are being um, purported elsewhere, such as the sexism or the allusions to pedophilia that are seen very commonly in a lot of anime series. With that in mind, the impacts of this are threefold. It's stereotypes 
uh, it perpetuates stereotypes, specifically stereotypes that are not in ideals with the progressive communities. The second impact is that this gives an idealistic look at Japan in comparison to everywhere else. And the third impact is that it does not show the proper culture of Japan, whether in a school setting or outside of it. On to my second contention for you today, Judge, the industry working conditions. My sub point A is the claim. Japanese anim animators endure horrid working conditions for minimal pay. Sub B, the warrant. The average hours per Jap Japanese animators is around 12 to 18 hours a day. They're severely overworked just to make in ends meet. In comparison, the average American works around 200 hours a month, while the average Japanese animator works somewhere between 400 and 600 hours a month. A 2017 job listing for animators offered just 770 yen an hour. Today, that would be around $7.10. Under an eight hour work shift, you'd just be earning $56 for a day. That is below a livable wage, even in America, but especially in Japan, where the minimum wage is 874 yen or $8.06. You can actually earn more money working as a convenience store clerk than or at McDonald's where you would be waking 980 yen an hour. Whereas in comparison to the animators in Japan who all, if they were to work a full 20 year career in the industry, um, well in their 40s, they would finally be earning a salary above Japanese poverty line. Further, hospitalization from overwork is a badge of honor in Japan, and many of these animators are working themselves to beyond the point that it is acceptable for their mental and physical health, even to the point of dying at their desks. Some evidence from this is that uh, New York Times 2021 points out that illustrators average around uh, 36 thousand dollars a year for top line talent in the anime uh, environment. And further in uh, the Cool Japan program, they have found that these long hours violate Japanese labor, labor regulations, but the authorities take little interest in it, even because anime is such a central part of its public diplomacy program. Now, the impacts of this are threefold. We see increased suicide and mental health issues throughout the Japanese animation community. Second impact is that the work hours are far too long and do not allow these animators to sustain a reasonable quality of life. And the third impact is that with these low earnings, it takes a Japanese animator well into their 40s to achieve wages above the poverty line. Now, our third contention for you today is that all TV is the same. The claim is that TV of all form has bad elements. There's nothing special about it. The warrant is that TV is for the purpose of entertainment. There's nothing productive about anime, and it doesn't help you do your math homework or succeed in your career. According to the Perspective 2017, reality TV show excels in showcasing the lives of others, which can be extremely beneficial when raising awareness for mental health issues. For example, the show Hoarders Buried Alive on TLC gives an inside look into a disorder that had very little attention before it aired. So with that in mind, the impacts are threefold. The first one is that reality TV is more real than anime. The second impact is that anime does nothing to help you as a member of society. And the third impact is that TV inherently has flaws, but reality TV is still slightly better than anime. Now on to the AFS case today, Judge. Their first contention that the Japanese economy is reliant on this is really not something that we want to take into consideration. As we highlight in our second condition, these animators are not receiving the benefits of this. It's merely going to the stockholders of these companies while these animators work for cheap slave labor, just like justifying the Chinese economy's output because they use slave labor in the same way. So in a value debate, this should not be something that we look to encourage. Onto their second contention with cultural decay, they have no source for reality TV being bad. They just stand up here and suppose that you're going to believe into that. Further, the pedophilia that is shown in anime is very detrimental to society. At least reality TV, like Chris Hansen's shows, show what is wrong with pedophilia. Further, when they talk about addictive influences, detrimental impacts of worldview, and influences on children, these are non-unique arguments. Just because reality TV might have those influences doesn't mean that anime doesn't have those poor influences. One major difference is that reality TV is still real people, while anime is not real. So with that in mind, I strongly urge a vote for the negation, and I thank you for your time. Thank All you, right. Eli. Are there um, questions? Yeah, I do have some questions. Okay. So in terms of the second contention, um, how many employees are there that are being paid these wages? Every animator in Japan. Every single animator in Japan. What's the yes. source on that? So as, as I was pointing What's the source out, on that? as I was pointing out, the median animal income for Japanese animators um, as of 2021 is merely $36,000. 
and that is from Japanese Animation Creators Association, which is the it's their equivalent of a labor board. Okay. Um. All right. That out of the way. Um. That's the only question I had. So you guys, yeah, right. everyone can mute, and then I was going to. All right. We'll begin now with our member of the government, Ethan Garrett. Hold on. My timer just glitched. Out. All right. I got it. All right. Let's start on their first contention talking about stereotypes. A few problems. First of all, you can turn it because Salon explains that many of these norms that it promotes actually are good for women's rights and women's acceptance. They cite multiple studies that actually look at this. And if we look at more extreme versions of anime that are actually include sexual themes, they find that these sexual themes and promoting them actually promotes people to be more aware of addressing these things like women's rights and like pedophilia. You should prefer the studies, not simply their unfounded assertions. And on the second hand, they give you no comparative at all. They don't tell you how anime is better than reality TV. They don't tell you what norms exist in either or. They don't tell you that. Finally, there's not going to be a lot of impact here because they don't give you a quantified impact because there's nothing that like saying a bad story can actually lead to something. So like just because the story is not well written doesn't mean people are actually going to be hurt. Whereas if the economy is damaged, they actually are going to be hurt. Let's go to the second contention talking about conditions. There's a lot of problems here as well. First of all, they don't tell you why these people aren't accepting their jobs. If it's true that many of these people are living in poverty, then that's on net a good thing because if they weren't taking these low wage jobs, they would be in poverty. As bad as these low wage jobs are, it would be even worse for them to struggle in poverty. And on the second hand, what we see is that many of these conditions are being helped in the status quo. Kotaku reports that many of these wages of these workers have expanded in the past 10 years alone, meaning that these wages are going to continue to rise and it's going to be a non-issue in the future. And the third hand, econ completely outweighs because we're taking away 9% of their GDP. So even if these people are hurt, if we destroy the entire Japanese economy, then a lot more people are going to be hurt because the other people who are making high wages and who are getting vacation time because these traditions are going to be hurt even more. And that's going to completely outweigh um, finally is on depth. They tell you the median wage, which means a lot of people are going to be making above that wage. And they use medians, which are extremely bad because a few low wage workers can bring the entire median down. And they say every single worker in Japan makes these wages. No, that's just the median wage, which can vary for industry to industry and from each factory to each factory, which means we don't know how many people are actually making these wages. And finally, they don't tell you how many people live, work in the anime industry. The last thing I want to say is that there's nothing inherent to anime that makes it low wages. Just because coincidentally anime and low wages exist doesn't mean it has to be so. They need to tell you why anime existing necessarily leads to low wages. With that, let's go to the third contention. They say that all TV is the same and that it promotes good things, but there's a few problems with this. First of all, the New York Times in an interview with the producer of VH1, one of the key reality TV networks, actually found that everything is completely staged because they stick cameras in these guys' faces and they actually try and get events and provoke them into certain fights and certain conflicts to get the highest amount of ratings. So it's not actually promoting any skills and they don't give you any evidence that it actually is based on reality, which means you can't believe this contention. And second of all, you can turn it. They say anime does real world skills, but that's completely wrong. Ellis um, 21 explains that animes, people who watch anime are shown to be better at studying overall compared to people who don't watch anime, which means anime does have a net positive effect on people. And if we look at things like reality TV, we see that of all the studies we cited in our opening speech, that it actually doesn't lead to this. Um, so finally, I want to address the thing at the top, which says like anime allows people to like uh, look at people or not look at people or not be real or whatever like that's just good that means anime can allow people to be more fantastical allows people to imagine more unrealistic scenarios and allows a more creative process overall we outweigh first because we because taking away anime takes away a fundamental tradition of all Japanese people, which is to buy comics, is to watch TV, is to watch movies, is to go to the movie theater. All of these are fundamental to the Japanese identity ever since they started reconstructing after World War II. We also outweigh because 9% of the economy, which is worse than the Great Depression, outweighs any of the conditions they ever talk about at all in any of their cases. Now let's talk about my case. A few problems with their responses. They don't respond to the economy contention at all. All they say is that people are making low wages, but that's just their case. They don't tell you why it's not actually good for the economy. We give you the comparative. Reality TV is bad for the economy because it lowers property values. That means it hurts the US economy. Even if they want to say that low wages are bad, you still need to answer the fact that these low wages or these sectors that employ low wage workers allow the rest of the economy to thrive, which means even if they did employ low wages, you'd still have to answer the fact that it allows Japan to sustain 9% of its economy and 77% of its exports. That goes cleanly unrefuted throughout the debate, which is extremely important 
because this can allow the Japanese economy to thrive and employ other people of high wages. And Japanese have lower working hours on average than the United States, according to the OECD and the People's Policy Project, which means, yes, Japan is outperforming the United States, despite what they say. The second thing on decay, again, they're just cross-applying their contention, which I already answered with the salon evidence. Because Japan Japanese anime has themes like this and of a sexual nature, it promotes things like women's rights because people are more aware of sexuality and they're not going to punish women for things like promiscuity and other themes lead to a similar thing and the evidence points to that which means objectively we are correct on this question and then they say we don't have any sources for this but we cite multiple studies that review the evidence on reality tv reality tv is not only very addicting but it also leads people to it also leads people to per have certain perceptions about reality that aren't actually true. Let's look at their um, evidence. They say hoarders is good because it promotes mental health. No, hoarders does not promote mental health. It promotes people shaming and looking at people who hoard, who have a legitimate mental issue, and it turns into entertainment. That absolutely is not something good and something we should not be promoting in society. And our opponents are holding them up as some kind of standard of what actually promotes mental health. Overall, Japanese anime promotes a good tradition, promotes women's rights, it helps the overall economy, and, and the problems with it really are not as large as my opponents say they are. There's really no reason why you shouldn't be accepting anime in today's debate, and with that, I'm proudly, I'm proudly urge an affirmative ballot. And I stand open to questions. Thank you. Question? I don't have any. Do you have any, Eli? Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so we'll go to our leader of the opposition uh, rebuttal, back to Eli Gale. Um, it, it should was... be the MGC. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> MOC. <laughs> sorry. We'll back up and say we'll go to our member of the opposition, Julian McKenzie. Okay. So there's one major problem when looking at the case of the government. Something that they don't really address in this last speech. They don't address this idea of utilitarianism, the greatest amount of good for the most amount of people. Now, right now, their ideas of this is basically anime is making a large part of the Japanese economy. However, really when looking at our counters to social health, mental health, suicide. They don't really talk about this. I think one of the biggest problems is when they address our contention too. They don't address this entire idea of lives. They basically just say that wages are going to get higher. They have no evidence that wages are just going to get higher for these workers. And yes, they have this example basically saying that the median doesn't mean all workers, but a median means most workers. This is just a huge problem. It's a huge problem because people are directly committing suicide because of these low wages. And they have no response to this. They have no response to reality TV doing the exact same thing. And they have no response to counter this original statement that anime is causing this to happen. Now, let's just look at utilitarianism and let's look at value debate as a concept as a whole. When talking about utilitarianism, yes, it talks about the greatest amount of good for the most amount of people. But greatest amount of good, when looking at a value such as this, we have to value something like lives over something like monetary gain. Lives are way more important than money. And time and time again, the government believes money is more important than lives. So let's go back over first. They talk about the Japanese economy, which once again, they have no source for lower property values like their claims that reality TV causes poor behavior. And they also provide cherry picked arguments that are not supported by evidence. And workers aren't going to have better mental health. We already proved this. They have no evidence for why wages are just going to rise randomly. And because they provide me no evidence, then this entire Japanese economy contention is just going to have to fall. And as well, I also have to point out that there's no plan of action to get rid of anime. That's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about how reality TV is better than anime. 
And it's better than anime because these people aren't committing suicide because of reality TV. Now, I think it's very important when addressing their contention too, because they talk about this cultural decay. However, once again, and this argument is hardly addressed by the government, where it's a big argument that we make on the opposition, pedophilia is just wrong. And anime is showing pedophilia right now in the status quo. Now, even if there is a lower age of consent in Japan, basically, the pedophilia being shown in anime is even younger than this. It's showing like 20-year-old guys hooking up with 10-year-old girls. This is just wrong for multiple reasons. And we give you this example of Chris Hansen's show, which basically points out these predators and tries to basically get them arrested. Because is not. There was no age of consent for someone who's 10 years old. And we shouldn't show an anime that says it's okay for a 10 year old to date someone who's 20 years old. That's just inherently wrong. So when looking at this cultural decay, they talk a lot about how reality TV is just bad for society, how it's hurting people. And they also make this argument that basically sexuality is being helped. How is this being helped? The age of content, consent should not be 10 years old. We should not be showing 20-year-old males that it's okay to date someone that's 10 years old. This is just something that should not be shown throughout anime. This is just inherently wrong. And it's not showing the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. So when looking back at our case, they make a lot of counters. First off, when talking about anime stereotypes, they basically make this counter that it's basically helping people. And it's helping people because it's showing them their sexuality. Well, although I agree that certain themes can show and help sexuality, pedophilia would not be one of these. As well, when talking about stereotypes in general, they never talk about excessive politeness, mini skirts all year round, and how Japan is going to be more sophisticated than any other country in the world. Japan shouldn't be ranked above every other country just because they're Japanese. Every country should be equal. As well, when talking about our contention too, when talking about industry working conditions, they never show you why these wages are going to raise. And because they never show you why these wages are going to raise, all of our impacts, talking about suicide and mental health issues, how these work hours are long and how earnings are too low, are just going to have to end. When looking at our contention three on how reality TV and just all TV in general is basically the same, but reality TV is providing you with something realistic, this is also going to have to stand because even their, them talking about property values, they have no evidence for this. And really, if you want the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people, you're going to have to urge a ballot for the opposition. And I am proud to urge a ballot for the opposition, and there really is no other choice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia McKenzie. And now we go into our rebuttals with our leader of the opposition rebuttal, Eli Gale. Wait, just very quickly, Becca, are you wait, are you on the document? Or okay, thank you. I was just making sure. Now, this has been a very interesting debate, um, but I think at the end of the day, it's pretty clear how this debate is going. And with that in mind, Judge, I have four voters for you today that I think are going to crystallize a vote for the negation. And without further ado, I'm going to jump straight into them. My first voter for you today, Judge, is the mental health awareness and the other issues that reality TV brings to the limelight. We've highlighted the idea of the fact that Porter's brought to the limelight this issue, this mental health disorder that a lot of people weren't aware of previously. And it allowed them to know that this was an issue out there so that we could identify these people and help seek that they get treatment. Further, we also looked at Chris Hansen and how he was combating pedophilia in his reality TV show. And like many other reality TV shows, this brings issues to the forefront of society's mind, which is something that anime simply fails to do at the end of the day. On to our second voter for you today, Judge. It's going to be the purported stereotypes that we see throughout anime. We both have sat here today, Judge, to agree on the fact that things like racism, sexism, and pedophilia are rampant themes that are not acceptable in modern society. However, at the end of the day, Judge, we on the negation still stand that 
although the app claims that depicting these tropes somehow combats them, that this is simply not factual. And that by continually depict, depicting these tropes as the norm, it encourages this type style of thinking as acceptable. Refer back again to the app's case where they were saying that, that by making people aware of this, it is going to influence children because they have not been fully developed. And anime is doing just this when it comes to these harmful stereotypes, these harmful tropes that are prevalent throughout the industry. Now onto my third condition for you today, Judge, it's going to be these abhorrent working conditions that these animators are facing on a daily basis. As my partner clearly stated, GDP is not outweighed by the lives and the lifestyle of these animators. Encouraging these working conditions, these workers to live and work in poverty conditions is simply unacceptable. 600 hours a month on average, which is three times the workload of the average American, and for a mere $36,000 a year, looking again to that 2019 New York Times article. And then further looking again at um, the Cool Japan program and how it's highlighting the fact that these long hours that these animators are working directly violate Japanese labor regulations, but authorities take little interest in the matter. They do nothing to combat this. We aren't saying that we need to abolish the Japanese uh, anime industry and force Japan to deal with a 9% loss in their GDP. In fact, we're simply saying that we should sustain that environment, but allow these animators to receive proper compensation for their work. And until we correct the living conditions, these poverty wages that these animators are doing, we should not be supporting this industry, Judge. And at the end of the day, that is a major takeaway that we only see on the anime side. Nothing is being brought up about reality TV living in poverty wages for that. And then finally, Judge, is going to be the impacts that we've outlined to you today on the negatives case. The first impact, actually, the there are nine of them. The first impact, stereotypes are perpetuated. No one is arguing against the fact that anime perpetuates the stereotypes. Second impact, that it gives this idealistic and possibly racist view of Japan as a hyper ideal society in comparison to everywhere else, with, which the app never contests. Third impact, that it doesn't show the proper and genuine culture of Japan. The fourth impact, the suicide and mental health of issues that abound throughout the Japanese animation community, which is never contested. The fifth impact, these excessively long work hours that do not allow these animators to sustain a reasonable quality of life and the impoverished wages as my sixth impact that are far too low with the average Japanese animator working well into their 40s to simply be above the poverty line. My seventh impact, again, looking at reality TV is that reality TV is more real. You are actually learning uh, and seeing genuine human interactions on that in comparison to these ideal ones of anime. The eighth impact, there is simply nothing that anime does to help you as a productive member of society. The ninth and final impact is that all TV inherently has flaws, but reality TV at the end of the day is simply slightly better than anime. And in this view of the greater good with utilitarianism, at the end of the day, Judge, I see no other reason than to vote for the negation. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Eli Gale. And now we will go to our final speaker, our Prime Minister rebuttal with Becca Roundtree. Today's debate was a lot of fun and I would like to reiterate the resolution for today one more time. Anime is better than reality TV. I wholeheartedly agree with this and I would like to go into the reasons why I agree with this. The first voter for today would be Econ. In order to determine if anime is better than reality TV, we must determine which is more harmful when gone. Think about the D Great Depression, how many lives were destroyed, and that was only 2.7 of the economy. Anime is about 9%, around three times as bad. This affects way more people, especially when they do not tell you how many people are actually affected with low wages or mental health. This means we outweigh on presumptions as, as we tell you how it affects the economy with, hey, it may only come back with, hey, say how lives are better than money, but we dive into percents and facts into poverty and how suicide and suicide happens all the time, they say, but we provide the evidence. We give you evidence about Koteko and Yang Shang, et cetera, since they never addressed this evidence. The second would be burdens. Judge, you have to ask yourself about each of my opponent's contentions. How is this inherent to anime? Just because most of animes have these things on low wages or pedophilia, why does this have to be necessary for anime to exist? There are some animes without pedophilia or pay their workers and they pay their workers well. And that's our, uh, could take out evidence. 
And since they have not answered this fundamental question, they have lost all of their arguments by default as they never met the burden of proof. The third uh, voter for today is the Salon evidence. The Salon evidence goes unrefuted and they say that it, it is a clear correlation between promotion of anime and especially with more sexualization themes and this woman's rights. This is evidence that the only one in this question in the, uh, in the round while they say it's to promote pedophilia, they do not provide any actual studies on this occurring. While the salon evidence is explicit and looks for looks through at multiple studies, the, our fourth voter would be the KO2 evidence. They never refute KO2 evidence, which says workers in the anime industry are seeing their wages rise as they take out their main contention. Our fifth one would be shame. They say people aren't committing suicide because reality TV, and they even talked about hoarders, how it's bringing light to all these hard topics that are hard to talk about and it's helping mental health. But no, it is just normalizing, shaming people for things. Hoarding is a serious problem. It should be taken seriously, not just broadcasted for the world for entertainment. It is dehumanizing for these people and it's outright disgusting. And they talk, they go so far into talking about how pedophilic anime is. But like in my first speech, I mentioned Toddlers and Tiaras, a show where they literally strap fake boobs onto little girls for entertainment. That is disgusting. So they're pointing all of these fingers at anime, but they're not reflecting at reality TV themselves. And our last voter for today would be Cre creativity. Anime is art. It is hand-drawn or computer-drawn, and it is people pouring their hearts into this art for people to enjoy. Like I mentioned in my first speech, anime is an amazing source that helps children and adults discover different cultures and different styles of art they might never have experienced before, and they're widening their views of the world and making them into more well-rounded adults. So today's debate talked about a lot of things, but I think I've made it very, very clear that anime is head and shoulders above reality TV because reality TV does all of the things that they said anime did on an even bigger scale because it is with real, real people. It is not with drawings or animation or art. These are real human beings that have lives outside of TV, have families, have mental health. So how are you saying that anime is contributing to suicide when reality TV is working with real people? These are real little kids, sometimes adults, that have to get affected by how their lives are getting tampered with like little puppets for entertainment. And that is disgusting. That is why I think that the affirmative won today's case.